Thanks to everyone for joining this robust intelligence hosted webinar today on the importance of AI risk management following NIST's AI risk management framework launch on January 26th. It's exciting to have such a range of audience members from various industries like financial services, human resources, and insurance to name a few with us today and relevant stakeholders from the world of policymaking, non-regulatory standardization, and members from the broader responsible AI community. Um, a quick note to start us off, uh, please feel free to send in any questions you have throughout the webinar into the Q&A channel, and we'll do our best to get to uh, a few of them if possible. Um, we can kick off the webinar with some brief introductions. To start, my name is Ali. I work on the product team here at Robust Intelligence, um, and I focus on our policy, regulatory, and bias and fairness efforts. Um, I'll pass it over to my co-host Hiram to go ahead and introduce himself. Uh, thank you, Ali. My name is Hiram Anderson, Distinguished Engineer at Robust Intelligence. Um, at times, it feels like the rate of AI adoption is outpacing our ability to manage the risks. And our mission at Robust Intelligence is to fix that, to instill machine learning integrity into AI adoption um, by, by testing models for operational security ethical risks. Um, but <clears throat> that practice has to live inside kind of a broader framework of risk management. So we're naturally quite excited to be hosting a fireside chat on this topic. So Ali. Thanks, Hiram. Um, and now over to Reva, our guest of honor today. We're so excited to have Reva Schwartz join us from the U.S. Department of Commerce's National Institute of Standards and Technology, referred to as NIST, to talk about the recent launch of their AI risk management framework. Reva was a key contributor to this framework and has led the AI bias efforts as principal investigator working for NIST's Trustworthy and Responsible AI program. Reva, along with her team at NIST, are leading players in the growing world of responsible AI. I'll pass it over to her to introduce herself and talk about how she became involved with NIST and generally interested in this field of work. Well, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone, and thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here and really excited to hear about uh, the, the push towards, you know, companies filling in this space uh, to, to manage risks of AI because they are uh, outpacing uh, what we can actually do. Um, yeah, my, my name is Ruby Schwartz. I'm a, a research scientist at NIST in the Information Technology Laboratory, where I'm part of the Trustworthy and Responsible AI team. Uh, the vast uh, majority of our time up until about two weeks ago was taken up with putting out the AI risk management framework, but I also um, am the principal investigator for bias in artificial intelligence and um, just kind of uh, generally trying to uh, push towards uh, uh, evaluation of trustworthiness, what that means, how we think about impacts and harms. So um, I, I guess I can, <laughs> I, I, the second part of that question, I will answer. Um, uh, my background is in linguistics and I used to be a forensic practitioner in a very obscure field known as forensic speaker recognition. That's an area that um, kind of it, uh, had a lot of, a lot to do with biometrics and automation, um, the early days of uh, deep learning uh, and machine learning. Uh, so I used to work with a lot of automated tools that were developed uh, for me by some amazing engineers and computer scientists over the years. But over time, what, uh, what I found in my job and what other um, forensic practitioners, what we found and, and you know, across just that domain, but then it, of course it's in every domain, is that there's mismatches between how tech is developed versus how it's used very often by experts, regardless of field. So there's a lot of opportunity in when AI is uh, adopted in, in, in high risk settings, especially is concerning uh, for different types of bias and perceptions about tech and what it can be used for, how valid and reliable uh, technology actually is, has it been validated. Um, so my focus when I wasn't doing forensic casework was to develop approaches for how to improve forensic practice, um, especially related to AI systems or uh, automated systems back then. Um, and my field um, was especially vulnerable uh, to invalid or untested approaches, so kind of um, pseudoscientific approaches, which can have um, serious downstream consequences and impacts in the criminal justice uh, community. So um, I became very interested in that and, and uh, came to NIST to work with uh, uh, on forensic practice and then moved over to, um, to Trustworthy and Responsible AI, a field that is uh, near and dear to my heart. <laughs> Super interesting to hear about your background. Um, 
Reva, to start us off, I'd love for you to provide some general context about NIST's role in non-regulatory standardization and why and when NIST, um, why and when does NIST become involved in these things? Yeah, so uh, we get involved. Our background is, um, our, our bread and butter is measurement. We like to say standards is our middle name. <laughs> um, our, our NIST has a long history of cultivating trust and technology, um, but we, uh, based on our experience, specifically for the for the AI risk management framework, based on our uh, widely adopted cybersecurity framework and the privacy framework, Congress um, uh, mandated us to build a, a similar framework for AI and, and AI risks back in January 2021. And um, that's that's how we, I mean, we were kind of moving in that direction anyway. But once they uh, uh, mandated us to do that, that's that's how we that's how it came to us. Great. Thanks, Ruba. So when it comes to the NIST AI RMF, which is the abbrevi abbreviated AI risk management framework, which is what we'll be referring to it as moving forward because it's quite a mouthful, um, perhaps some background on it and its intended goal. I know you just mentioned it was a mandate from uh, Congress, um, but just hearing a little bit more about its intended goal, I think would be really helpful for our listeners and just walking us through how the, camp, the framework just generally came to fruition after this mandate and the 18 months of work and the three rounds of drafts and, you know, the workshops. Um, yeah, just hearing about the process a little bit more. Yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll start with um, what the goal is, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the process. So the goal is, and, and what we hope uh, we have delivered, is a voluntary resource that is not regulatory or, or mandatory in any way uh, to equip organizations with approaches that increase AI system trustworthiness and responsible design, development, deployment, and use of AI systems. So the resource, uh, the framework is uh, primary audience, audience is mostly AI organizations that design, develop, or deploy, or use AI technology. Um, but there's also, um, you know, a, a variety of other audiences that could be, uh, it, that could feed into that. Um, but <clears throat> when we talk about risks, I mean, I, I'm sure that this audience is familiar, but uh, to help um, AI organizations manage risks like, um, it, well, risks that can impact individuals, groups, communities, society, and the environment. So things like uh, privacy leaks, um, being unfairly overlooked for a job, uh, not being able to understand why you were overlooked for that job, um, and then uh, uh, the the risks to companies who may uh, be uh, inadvertently exposed to um, being non-compliant with uh, regulation, um, being presented for individuals who are presented with information that stigmatizes you based on your race or gender while you're online, or just an AI system that's not working as claimed. Um, so, so the framework is voluntary. It's uh, it's non-prescriptive. It is uh, we like to say it is rights affirming. That just means that uh, protection of individual rights is at the forefront of 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 how uh, AI systems are developed and used. And it seeks to operationalize trustworthiness, which is really indirectly our societal values, uh, change the way we think about and approach AI systems, and establish responsible practice and use of AI. Uh, uh, central to kind of the way we approach it is through a socio-technical approach, which just means that AI systems are more than the data and the model and the algorithm. There are um, humans in the data, humans in the model who are building the model, and the algorithms and, and the systems impact, impact um, uh, individuals in society. Um, so we do this through four functions. We can, we can talk about those functions later. Um, and then we also created a playbook. But basically we think it's kind of the first attempt to come to a shared understanding of what AI risk is. It acknowledges the fact that there are risks in AI and with AI, um, what, what trustworthiness is, coming to a shared understanding of that. Um, again, an attempt to bring socio-technical approaches to the forefront. Um, so we spent 18 months, um, the process was about 18 months long. We started this in, um, gosh, it was June, 2021. We had a, a uh, in Washington speak, an RFI or a request for information. Um, we heard back um, from people. And then we just basically got on this uh, hamster wheel where we were uh, writing something, releasing it, hearing from people. We'd have a workshop and, and we'd have, you know, meetings with, with uh, various, uh, with organizations, either private industry, academia, uh, civil society, uh, government partners. And, um, 
Uh, 18 months later, we were about 240 comments, uh, 240 organizations who submitted about 400 comments. And then uh, you can see all of that's online. So you can see um, uh, how, how our document changed over time. Yeah. Um, you, you just mentioned the playbook, which I would lo love to talk about a little bit more in a second. But first, um, I want to touch on that collaborative approach a little bit more. Um, I, I attended those workshops and they were really interesting and really well run. And it was clear that NIST uh, really valued that collaborative piece to creating the AI RMF. Um, so my next question uh, along those lines is, is about that. Um, it's It was very clear throughout the 18 months that um, that including the broader public and a wide range of stakeholders was a core factor in the creation of the AI RMF. And uh, my question is, how did the process of going through those drafts and prioritizing this multi-stakeholder approach work in building the framework? And why was that collab collaborative approach so important to the creation of this? Yeah, and so I've said that, I mean, we say this a lot, that um, open and transparent and multi-stakeholder is kind of how NIST always does business. We're a small agency, so we, we do rely on um, our partners. But this was a little different in that uh, instead of kind of going to the same people um, we tend to go to or people who were involved with the cybersecurity framework or, or the privacy framework, they were brought along, but we also were consistently seeking and striving to bring in new voices, new companies that we hadn't heard from, new um, new groups that we hadn't heard from. We certainly, um, you know, we did strive to uh, bring in community groups or other individuals, but, but the reason for that, of course, is because risks um, of AI impact uh, beyond the enterprise. It is not just the company that it impacts, and there's a lot of um, uh, researchers and organizations like yours who are looking to um, do what they can to make sure that uh, when technology is released, that it's released safely. And so we wanted to hear from the, the practitioner perspective, the people who are you know operating out in the real world and 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 doing that. We knew if we didn't do that, it wouldn't um, the framework wouldn't be as uh, you know authentic, valid than it, as than it could be. Great. Uh, so back to the playbook, um, that's, it was a super interesting, uh, part of the, uh, release of the framework and the, as a part of the launch. Um, and to my understanding, the, including that companion playbook was actually not in the original plan and it was kind of added in later. Um, can you kind of walk us through what the playbook is, first of all, uh, what's, what it's intended to be used for and by who and, and why it was decided to become a part of the framework launch? Yeah, so the playbook's actually pretty um in 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 design is pretty straightforward. It's directly connected to the four uh tables in, in the framework. Uh, so you know, for those of you who are not like super in the weeds on the AI risk management framework, there's uh the, the AI RMF core, which is four functions. So it's govern, map, measure, manage. And within within the framework, we lay out like what what do companies need to do to to govern for from a different perspective for AI risk management. How should they, what does map mean? What does measure mean? How do we measure risks? How can we manage risks? So we have uh, categories and subcategories uh, for kind of in general, these are the outcomes that companies should be thinking of when they're trying to manage risks or, or govern, govern, you know, for each of those four functions. And um, what we heard was, you know, that's great. There's these outcomes, but how, how do we do it? So this is where you should be going. And we, um, you know, we, we try to be non-prescriptive, but people did want some kind of um, uh, path, you know, for how, how, how to actually meet those outcomes. So on one hand, we, we were trying to meet people's requests, but we also recognize that if we put something out there and we didn't tell people how to, how to meet those, those goals, that people might just default to how things always were and, and not much is going to change. And so we wanted to make sure we were saying, oh, no, no, like this way, this way, you know, nudging people towards uh, the kinds of um, tasks they might be doing. So, um, and then within, within the framework, we have, uh, you know, just kind of a brief, we try to keep it brief on description of, of what, what is this thing that, we, what is the specific task that you're talking about? And then we have suggested actions on how organizations might meet that. It's very, uh, we should be very, very clear that it's a lot of things. There's a lot there. We do not, um, the, the playbook is not intended to be a checklist. So organizations shouldn't go through it like, yep, we did that, we did that. Um, because it's really about building culture. Um, 
And it's a little bit, it's almost a little bit like a warehouse. Like you can, you know, organizations can kind of drive through and pick out the things that they think they could adopt relatively easily or, or that really apply to them, but they um, should not under any circumstances feel uh, that they have to do all of these things. And so the reason we decided, you know, to not to separate it from the framework was that, um, the framework, well, first of all, it would have been way too long if we also told people how to do it. Um, but the framework is meant to be uh, relatively stable for like a, a long period of time, three to five years. And the, uh, with obviously the pace of AI, things are constantly changing. So the playbook would, you know, we're going to update that twice per year um, based on input from, from you all, from the public and the community. Reva, so there, there's a standard and it's non regulatory. <laughs> and by design, it's actually a bit vague. And as you mentioned, this playbook right. maybe maybe helps you uh, go from this like overall principles and functions into something that's concrete. Mm -hmm. um, can, can to to kind of help some of our listeners maybe today, would you first mind summarizing kind of the, the four elements mm -hmm. of the yeah. AI, AI RMF core? Yeah, so sure. Govern, Absolutely. map, measure, manage. Yes, thank you. Yeah, and so we. Uh, say that uh, these functions could happen in any uh, order, but really, really um, govern is the foundational piece. Without govern, um, uh, for especially for designing, developing, or deploying, or using AI, um, governance has to be at its core. So what governance is, is making sure that the organization recognizes um, uh, what the legal and regulatory requirements are in their setting, um, what their risk tolerance is or should be. So are, are they under, um, you know, is it is it like regulated by the FDA and then therefore there's a certain type of risk tolerance. Um, so there's all that kind of like um, just doing business, but then there's also um, this commitment from organizational management that AI risks are important and require a uh, special uh, approach to it, that somebody is accountable. Um, there's policies, procedures, and practices for all of the things to make sure that it's not just a, a um, you know, we, we say that AI risks are important, but we have things in place to actually put um, put teeth into that. And so that's that's what the govern process is, uh, govern, govern function. The map function is kind of uh, we like I like to say it's where organizations can build their socio-technical footing. Um, so it's all about the context. So um, and not just what type of what type of tool you're building or where it might be used. So it's not uh, okay. Uh, our context is lending. It's bigger than that. Um, how do we scope? How do we scope within what that task is? How can we think really effectively about what potential impacts could be? Um, and that's why it's really, really um, uh, so first of all, it's important to just continuously like refine that, refine it. So we, we, when we talk about mapping, but uh, a key, a key um, a requirement throughout not just uh, not just map, but also govern is an, a team internally that has the skill set, uh, a diverse set of skills that's a, a interdisciplinary. If you don't have a big team and you don't have interdisciplinarity, um, you know, other ways that you might fulfill that to make sure that you're not uh, missing um, blind spots or falling into any uh, pitfalls. So it's it's really just trying to keep uh, very um, uh, explicit and aware of what the impacts and, and risks of the AI that you're trying to develop or design are about. Uh, measure um, is where you uh, basically take all those risks that you enumerated in the map function and try and figure out. So if, um, you know, it, it, what, what the risks are, so you've identified them, but also to what the trustworthy, what are the trustworthy characteristics that are, you know, particularly notable. So if you're building a lending app and you've identified a certain number of risks and those risks tend to be related to uh, trustworthy characteristics of bias or privacy or security, then you're gonna be testing and measuring those throughout the measure function. And then manage is just where, you know, after you've measured all of this stuff, what do you do next? And it's almost, you know, it's a, a culture of continuous continuous measurement, continuous a continual monitoring, continual improvement, and then, you know, you can, this is meant to be iterative uh, so that you're consistently tracking for incidents or any kind of uh, negative impacts or positive impacts <laughs> that you weren't considering. 
I like that. You know, sometimes we think about um, management or or about you know risk as a as a checkbox exercise, and then when you're yeah. done, the checks are done. But that's not the case. You know, managing risk is an iterative process. Yeah. Um, so so Riva, to to help some of some of us kind of walk through what this would mean for us at our company. Can can you can you help us to understand like like if if I'm a business and I I want to sink my teeth in, how do I know that the RMF is for me? How do mm-hmm. I get started? Like maybe, maybe do you have some examples of of organizations who have begun to do this that that would help me to see kind of my path to becoming a, a better manager of AI risk? Yeah, so uh, we, you know, uh, we knew we were going to get asked for, for you know, where's our tech? Where's some kind of something? Um, we will be releasing a, a process. Uh, we talk about profiles and we talk about use cases. Uh, profiles are not really necessarily meant to be um, one organization doing that internally, but you know, kind of the um, the quick and dirty and like really cheap and easy way to get started with the ARMF is to print out or copy over the tables into a spreadsheet and then add a bunch of extra columns and think about within your use case, you know, um, have I applied this? Do I need, um, what are what are the legal and regulatory requirements for, our, for this specific domain and that we need to follow? Um, and, and then, you know, just kind of track about have we have could we implement this? Are we implementing this already? Um, is it partially implementable? Does this apply to us? Um, is this something we might need to come back to in the future? How can we think about, you know, uh, all the there's, you know, a whole pile of uh, content about um, bringing in different different points of view. Most of that is so we can think about sampling bias, you know, that mm-hmm. we're always, you know, um, we're all really interested in trustworthy and responsible AI. So we kind of know what's, you know, we're, we're a certain cut on, on the curve, but um, uh, how can we bring in other points of view? And is that something, you know, that you think you're doing pretty well at, uh, or is that something, you know, a year from now you might come back to? Um, Reva, um, what like if if companies are doing this, um, what what's the what's the long term impact if if I'm a company um, investing in you know what might be a totally new concept for me? Often often AI companies are not security risk companies by design, so this might be a kind of a new function for me. What like why should I? What is the long term impact for me, for our nation, for our industry? Yeah, I think. That's a question we hear a lot. And so first I would say, you know, from a purely like selfish point for a company, you're protecting yourself from potentially reputational harm, right? Um, Also, you're probably going to maintain your staff a little better. You know, um, uh, we talk a lot about how um, your practices and, you know, this is from governance uh, stature that you're, you're kind of talking the talk or walking the walk that you have these publicly available, a lot of companies put out um, uh, principles. Uh, So are you, are your practices in line with those principles? And if they are, then that helps you, Uh, you know, it's, it's eventually that will be, that could be it would be nice if that could be a, a selling point. Um, but so it, it, it protects you from reputational it, potentially. Um, it helps you maintain your staff, but it's also an inner, it could become an interoperability thing that, you know, if enough mm-hmm. companies um, uh, begin to borrow AI or math and there becomes a community uh, focused on these, uh, you know, even, you know, either at a high level or like, we're really a, a company that's focused on measure or we're really focused on measure for, you know, um, for a secure and resilience or, or bias or bias and fairness. And so, and then, you know, we're information sharing across, across either um, within the company or across uh, uh, industries. And then, then it kind of can improve interoperability, which is always a win. <laughs> right, right, right. So as we're thinking about this AI risk management framework, you know, 1.0 was released, but it's actually only one of a really broad set of, you know, things that are out there. Companies yep, have released one, like my old excellent team at Microsoft released guidelines while I was yep. there. 
Mm -hmm. um, there, there's forthcoming regulatory compliance for which NIST doesn't take an active role. Mm -hmm. So generally, like if you yeah. if you take all of this together, what are the trends that you see um, nationally, globally in this broader discourse about managing AI risk that, that are in common that, that we all should watch out for? Absolutely. And, and you know, Microsoft's uh, uh, responsible AI standard is excellent. We were so excited to see it come out. Um, but then there's also all this stuff going on in Europe, the EU AI Act. So all of these things take a risk based approach to AI. Um, uh, and, and we just get there in different ways. Um, we're obviously very, um, you know, it's, it's very non-prescriptive. So we don't even tell people, um, although people wanted us to tell them, uh, how do I know when to use it? Am I, am I just supposed to do this for everything? And so it's not, um, I think if you're thinking about it as like, do we need to do this for every uh, application we put out there? Do we need to, it's, it should be like this cultural thing that, that puts principles to practice um, rather than uh, like the EU AI Act, which is like, if you, if you have, uh, if you're putting out something in this high risk category, you have to do it. So a, a lot of it's just kind of in scope and in tone. It's just, uh, it's just a different um I think it's it's certainly it's probably in between in the middle of all of these things, but they are all risk based and how um, how we get there is different. I like how you uh, earlier framed um, the the AI RMF from NIST as a set of principles that um, supposed to be for the long term. You know, mm -hmm. so like m maybe it's the case that if companies are adopting uh, principles about governing, measuring, managing, mapping then then like that's that's in some sense future proof to to other even regulatory complaints that might come come through that you already have that muscle and that that mechanism available to 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 be responsible in the way would, would that be accurate to say yeah i think that's right and you know one of the other uh, big benefits so we have in in i think it's like section 5 in the framework we go through like here's all the here's all the things that if you if you adopt this here's the things you're going to get you know like um yeah yeah Know, a tote bag or <laughs> but but you're also going to get like um you know we are we're NIST we're all about measurement so we talk a lot about TEV or testing evaluation validation and verification and you know uh I don't think so a, a, a lot of one other uh standard that we we I didn't actually answer uh or discuss in the last answer was uh, model risk management for for the finance industry. So there's a lot of really great practices in there um, that we kind of adopted. Model validation, making sure that your teams are independent so that they're not influencing each other. Um, but uh, testing practices, evaluation practices are, are extremely, it, these are relatively small changes and they can be very impactful. Yeah, um, so the the, a lot of this is geared towards protecting consumers of AI products. Um, does does it have an impact on the producers also? That like you know many of many maybe of the people adopting the standard are actually producing AI in a mm -hmm. way that is going to be safe for consumers. D do they do they both benefit from from adoption of of risk yeah. practices? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I mean, I think that now they have a repeatable process, right? Like uh, a, a lot of this is, you know, I I think I I would imagine that going through this the first time, I I don't think it's um we don't think it's that onerous, but you know we we built it, so we we don't see it. That there are some things that could take a lot of time. Um, it shouldn't be too onerous, and of course, none of it's mandatory. So pick what you can and try and adopt it. Um, but over time, you now have a repeatable uh, way of doing things, and you never know um, you never know how things are going to play out until you start to adopt it. So, you know, I, I do think that that this um, you know find what you can that's the you know kind of quickest and um, biggest bang for your buck that you know you can implement, and then you repeat it, and then next time around maybe you can do something different. But there's a lot in that, certainly a lot in the playbook um, for how um, for practices on on measuring on doing impact assessments on um you know thinking about impact differently thinking about risks and and how to anticipate them um reva actually a question from the audience that is uh kind of in line with what you were just talking about um what are the new roles we can expect to see resulting from efforts to manage ai risk ah, excellent question so 
we heard uh, back uh, quite a bit that when we had our testing evaluation and validation verification experts, we had TEV experts in the audience uh, section. And everybody's like, what's a TEV expert? That's not a thing. Yeah. Nobody has a job. And we're like, not yet, <laughs> but maybe they will. Um, we, we've also included impact assessors, the impact assessment team just clearly playing it out, um, socio-technical uh, or socio-cultural experts. Uh, and, and again, maybe these are not people that are in a small company, um, but those are people that you could contract with or um, or figure out how to get that that guidance. Obvi uh, domain experts uh, in you know obviously across the board, um, yeah. But tech experts probably the biggest one. <laughs> Super interesting. Yeah, it's it's crazy to see all these new. You know, I feel like this is a global thing for. There's always new jobs. What always what, new jobs? <laughs> what, what were you were learning about in you know elementary school? In your dream jobs, you know, couldn't have predicted what it was going to be. Have expert. Yeah. Have expert. Um, <laughs> uh, Reva, I actually have a question that kind of relates to uh, Hiram's last question about kind of general trends uh, nationally, mm -hmm. globally. Of course, NIST is non-regulatory and. Um, is, is a separate process from that. But I'm curious because, especially since you lead the work on AI bias, kind of your thoughts just generally around this AI bias audit, bias audit trend and, and kind of how things are starting to pick up. Um, this That's of course uh, an example from, from the United States with the New York City hiring law and some similar things coming out in other yeah. states. Um, and like you mentioned, the EU AI Act. I'm just kind of curious to hear about about your perspective on that, considering your your deep expertise in, in AI bias. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, no longer to be ignored. You know, it's becoming clearer and clearer how um, how much these systems are tied to our lives, and that well, I think probably um, you know legislative bodies across, or feel like they need to do something uh, to protect people, uh, protect the public from um, from AI, and and for us like. Uh, that it really gets to trust and in, in a way as well, like um, people may not uh, may just distrust technology to start with, but you could also these these things over time can chip away at trust. So um, and, and we also put, um, you know, we talked a lot in the, in the document or, or we have like a whole um, appendix on how AI differs from traditional software. And this is an example of that, right? Like we didn't have necessarily a lot of people creating uh, legislation on protecting us from like accounting software or, or word processing software. Um, but uh, the, 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 the nature of AI and, and how it learns and uh, the data and, and the impact, potential impacts and, you know, really high profile cases, you know, of like wrongful, um, wrongful arrests have created this kind of um, environment. So, um, you know, over time, we just have to assume that, you know, some aspects, some aspects of AI are going to be regulated more broadly. Yeah. And including maybe, you know, like everybody has to, we have to say it once, you know, the chat GBT, Dolly, <laughs> Uh, AlphaGo. There's a question actually uh, from from the chat uh, that that says that there seems to be uh, both intense FOMO and FUD around so fear of uncertainty, doubt, fear of missing out around generative mm -hmm. AI like ChatGPT, etc. Um, and a lot of legal and fair use issues around those models and the data used to train them. So mm -hmm. is the AI RMF general enough to accommodate? even these new kinds of, you know, these, these, these new applications of generative AI models? The answer is yes. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, our framework came out like right in the middle of, you know, it's only been two weeks. So it seems like uh, a thousand years that we've all been working with chat GPT, but, um, but AI, the way we define AI and AI system is, is an AI system and that it uh, as produces recommendations. So that falls, uh, generative AI square, falls squarely under our definition of AI system. I think, um, I mean, obviously the risks of, of chat GPT, like the, the chat GPT is like this great example of, of something that you can see all the positive benefits of AI in, in simultaneously in the negative, a potential for negative. So, you know, answers can be horribly wrong as we saw yesterday <laughs> with Google, <laughs> um, um, you know, just um, 
uh, things can be wrong and people may not know that they're wrong and um, and then and how that impacts. So and I think um, I'm we're not surprisingly getting pushed to potentially do a workshop on um, on generative AI. But it's not just you know it's not just chat, chat GPT. Obviously, the um, the there are real um, uh, um, proprietary. What is the word I'm looking for? You know, uh, 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 copyright uh, issues with uh, with uh, text to image generators, and um, we try to um, deal with that a little bit in the framework and talking about uh, for people being uh, for companies to consider. And that's another thing, like. Um, you know, companies can be could be liable for copyright violations if and and so we try to uh, make sure that companies are thinking about that if they're deploying uh, text to image generators. But there's also like text to text to image generators also um, can amplify and perpetuate um, uh, racial and, and gender stereotypes, uh, disability stereotypes, um, and it is not the data. It's not. It's not. It is. It is learn from the data, but it's also just inherent in the processes. And uh, even with these uh, kind of uh, careful prompt engineering, uh, these systems are are often unable to produce um, uh, non-derogatory, uh, non-discriminatory, uh, non-harmful images, so. So uh, Reva, just a follow-up question to that excellent one, race and chat. If, um, you know, as, as there are more applications of these models, the framework covers them generally. Do you see that there might be a need for, you know, further, more specific, maybe industry specific or application specific um, guidelines for use cases mm -hmm. in the future? Yeah, so thanks for asking that because I did not have a chance to talk about. So so yes, we have this super general framework, purposefully general because we were at, well, first of all, a framework kind of has to be, uh, we don't have examples in, we don't have any examples in the framework um, and it's purposefully uh, general. So um, for everybody who's like, hey, I don't see anything in here about lending. That's right, we were not supposed to do that. So we did exactly what we were supposed to do. That's now up to the community, right? Like now the community can build a profile and say, we have this really general thing. How does it apply for lending? So the lending community or the finance community or the criminal justice community can get together and uh, and, and create a profile, the process for which is, I promise, forthcoming. <laughs> um, and so then, uh, then you'd have this profile and while it does not have any kind of, um, you know, legislative or binding uh, stature, uh, it could be useful for, uh, for it, and if especially if it's developed in a consensus manner. So our our hope is that when we talk about profile development, that it's in, very inclusive of you know a number of players. Also, I would imagine that um, uh, companies don't want to develop that kind of thing on their own because it's it could be own that, that could take a while. Yeah, hundred um, percent. This is kind of backtracking a little bit, actually, but it's another question from the audience where it looks like we're getting um, some really interesting questions, which is exciting. But um, kind of to our earlier uh, discussion on general trends and global approaches, uh, this question asks, where do you see consensus in the AI RMF approach to trustworthy AI with other global approaches? And where do you believe it takes a novel approach? Um, yeah, so I think the novel approach is uh, we fully uh, take a socio-technical approach to uh, AI risks. And we don't really see that elsewhere. Um, uh, other, other guidance, um, you know, uh, uh, regulation tends to be uh, focused on uh, regulating data and the types of data, you know, that this is hard, you know, you sh should not have access to this kind of information. Um, a socio-technical approach is more focused on, you know, when you when you change that frame to thinking about the impact and saying, here's here's the impacts and the harms that we're trying to avoid. How do you go about changing that? And here's the controls and recommendations for how you can do that. Um, that's I think I think that's what makes ours different. Um, and uh, at our launch event, uh, Dr. Alondra Nelson, who was the uh, outgoing. Uh, 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 deputy director at OSTP had stated that very thing that um, our socio-technical approach was was unique. Reva, th this is this is a, a great question from the audience to maybe demonstrate um, how uh, how you can use the AI risk 
uh, management framework to get started on a particular question that you have. So the, the question is very particular, but maybe I could ask you to answer it by okay. you know, zooming out to the RMF a little bit. So the, the question is, um, you know, if, if, if we, if we want to deal with latent bias remediation in a model, so we, we shouldn't be considering race or political affiliation or income, but we do take zip code, you know, mm -hmm. so there's a latent right. bias. How, how, what is, what is my, uh, what is, what is my process for managing, you know, in this case, latent bias remediation in the context of the AI RMF? How, how does that map? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This so is, we sorry to put you on the spot. This hard one. No, no, no. It's a good question. <laughs> and so, I mean, the thing is, like, we don't have a lot of answers on how to approach um, bias from because, so, you know, we in, in the document that I, uh, we authored on um, uh, called SP 1270 towards a standard for identifying and managing bias in AI. We talk about the fact that everybody is so focused on computational bias that nobody's thinking about all the systemic bias. And uh, zip code is a great example <laughs> of uh, how systemic bias plays out and, and it's captured in that. And so, um, you know, we some of the recommendations we have in the playbook are about, you know, disaggregating um, analysis, working with sociocultural experts, so you can consider those things long ahead of time, how you might, um, uh, alternative data uh, is, is another option. Um, yeah, I mean, we don't, we don't have a lot of answers right now, other than, and, and it's, and it's very, um, it's very much not technical, right? It's very much not computational. Right now, all the computational um, approaches can only get us so far. And so what we need to do is be thinking about like, what are the sources? What could be sources of systemic bias in our in our data and the way we're formulating the problem in our objective function? Um, are our, um, uh, our constructs valid? So we, uh, you know, what are the proxies that you're trying to, what are the proxies that have been created and what are those constructs really trying to measure? Um, so is it valid? So if, if we're talking about um, zip code, why do you need zip code? You know, what, what, is, what are you actually trying to operationalize? So uh, for example, if it's, if it's hireability or criminality, those are, these are these things that are inherently unobservable. Um, how can we think uh, how, first of all, it, Maybe maybe we want to use something else to measure that because it's not observable. Um, but if you do need to create a proxy, you have to validate it first, and that means you um, you need you need validation testing, not not just um, pushing out a a proxy. And Reva, I love I love how you've taken this out to kind of a self assessment of do we really need what do we need? The 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 poster of this question rightly points out that you know simply removing zip code. Is often not enough because of right. other leakages, but mm -hmm. the the fact remains that you know the questions you're asking, the process of managing that risk. I think that's the point of the AI RMF, right? Um, that's exactly right. yeah, that's exactly right. Um, the map function and the and, and in this case also the measure function will really help you of like what what are you actually trying to measure and what are you trying to get at? Because it might not be the, and that's why it takes different people in the room, right? That's why it takes a different set of, um, uh, a, a set of uh, a different staff and interdisciplinary staff that, you know, it may not be like, well, we're just going to make, we always, we always create a proxy. Maybe you shouldn't be creating a proxy. <laughs> Maybe you should be thinking about some other, some other measure, uh, some other way to get at something. What is that? You know, again, this is yeah. a, the objective function, the problem that, as it's formulated. We know that there's a lot of um, inherent uh, in institutional biases that get inserted in problem formulation processes. So that's really a a, a, a stage where you know you want to make sure you've got a lot of different views in the room, and even including potentially going out to the communities and seeing like what are we missing? What could what what is what could we do instead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, 1.0 is out and, you know, because you gave it a number, it means someday there'll be, you know, 2.0, right? Yes, what, right? What is what is the process look like for keeping the RMF up to date? What mm -hmm. are the signals that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. um, 
how, how do you prevent it from getting becoming outdated by the needs of you know people in this call today who who are going to want to provide mm -hmm. input? Can can you walk us through that? Yeah. So we tried really, really hard. One of the reasons, like I said, we kept it general was because it had to be, it had to be as evergreen as it possibly could, knowing like nothing's evergreen in, in tech. Um, hopefully we can get three years uh, out of it. <laughs> um, we, three to five years, we say. Um, what we're looking for first is um, we're really all about evaluation and, and, and measurement at NIST. So we want to hear from people who use it. Um, we want to know, is it effective? What's not working? Um, and so if we can fix some of the what's not working through the playbook, um, we're going to do that. Like I said, the playbook will be updated. There's an open call. Uh, people can submit their, their comments and their contributions to the playbook at any time. Um, but uh, but the, the framework, it would take, you know, it, it, We'd, we'd have to put things on the back burner. And I, I think it would be something that was like, oh, it's completely out of date. And or the guidance that we have out there is contradictory or conflicting with something that's best practice that would require an update. Uh, it, might, it might not require a, a complete overhaul, but it might require an update. And if people want to provide that feedback, how do they do that? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for asking. So you can submit that to our, uh, our, and I can type it in the chat, but it's AI framework, all one word, at NIST.gov. Um, you can submit comments and contributions at any time. I should also note that in in the spring, so not too, you know, not too far from now, we are also going to be releasing, uh, and I think we've mentioned this before, our, our trustworthy and responsible AI resource center. What the resource center is, and it's not just an excuse for us to, to have something else, you know, some other <laughs> press release. Um, we are, yes, it will contain the, the framework and yes, it, it will create, it, it will also uh, hold a brand new overhaul of the, of the playbook. The playbook right now is just in beta form. Um, so that will be the more final and, um, and, and filterable playbook, right? So right now the playbook's just like, oh my gosh, it's so much stuff. So um, when that comes out, people will be able to kind of come in, register, say what kind of user they are. You know, I'm a, I'm a, um, you know, I'm an AI developer. Show me only the things I want to see. You know, um, and but it will also have all of our previously existing documents, future documents. There's a, a space for people to uh, uh, talk, uh, suggest that they would like to be part of a, a profile or that we're developing profiles. There's a space for people to contribute their own. Um, material content resources uh, for vetting, so. Uh, Reva, to zoom back out just quickly, a question I wanted to ask you, um, mostly because, well, the AI RMF is something that so many people are greatly benefiting from, including Robust Intelligence, our organization, and and a lot of other industry players and, and other even like policymakers. Um, I'm curious from the process of creating it and being at NIST and working on it tirelessly for the past 18 months, both what was one of the, the, the key challenges in creating the framework, um, whether that's about you know making it as general as possible, including the most interdisciplinary group to create it. And then also um, just from your personal perspective, if you could only pick one, what's the main thing that you want to come out of the framework? Okay, those are great questions. <laughs> so yes, I mean, I think probably the hardest thing was keeping it general. Um, the other hard thing was, but my my boss Alham Tabasi is amazing, so she's she always had a plan for this. It was um, people wanted to see a lot of things, and we thought we had to get everything out there right away. And um, so we we did figure out how to take our time with what you know, what could be released at which time, um, you know, we, we had to build these things slowly. So that was a little hard because we're getting, you know, like everybody wanted everything right away. Um, so that was really hard. Uh, keep making things general was very hard. The playbook was a lot of work. Um, it was a lot of work. Um, it's not easy going through a lot of comments. Uh, it's not easy balancing. Um, we had a lot of, you know, we had a lot of input from a lot of uh, different players, um, some people who, you know, often we'd have like, you know, 40 comments on a paragraph and uh, everybody wants uh, different things. So trying to figure out how to balance that um, was difficult. 
And oh, uh, if I could pick one, yeah, I mean, positive side. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd love. I, I'm, I am, you know, a linguist at heart, so I'd love this to help people figure out how to communicate across the silos. <laughs> that would be a huge win um, if people just uh, created a, a culture that was, you know, more interdisciplinary and more uh, that we're, we could all learn from each other about how to how to anticipate risk and how to manage risk. I think that's a huge win. Yeah, definitely. Um, I like that answer. <laughs> um, with our last uh, few minutes remaining, I think we can cover a couple more questions in the chat. Um, one of them seems uh, quick. Uh, where can I find the AIRMF playbook? Oh yeah, let me get the link. <laughs> uh, our, our playbook is, um, temporarily hosted on GitHub pages. Um, it is soon to be um, on our on an actual website. Um, should I put it, in, do I put it in chat or do you, the q and A? I I think the chat. Oh, there it is. There <laughs> I it. Yeah. All right, I think actually you might have um, sent it to. Oh, I can put it in the Q&A. Okay. In... Yeah. No, no, yeah, I think I did it. I think I put it in the right place. <laughs> Zoom woes, they never end. <laughs> um, and then one more, just uh, I'll start talking while you're finishing up with the link. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, ethical risks and bias and fairness today, which is, of course, a very important aspect of the risk management framework and how people are thinking about mitigating risk. But um, there's a good question here about uh, security of AI that uh, you might have some thoughts on. Uh, when it comes to this security aspects of AI risk, which org or organization should be responsible? So cybersecurity, data science, uh, or other orgs? For, for AI? Is that yeah. The... yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. So uh, one of the things we try to do with our framework is uh, say like, if, if there are all these other frameworks and things that are out there that can help you manage uh, risks, please use that. Um, so if it's a cybersecurity uh, uh, risk, then follow the cybersecurity framework. If it's explicitly privacy, follow the privacy framework. If it's all these other um, other topics, but I mean, we say and 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 we strongly believe this that it's a shared it's a shared responsibility. There's not one uh, person that, and I I think this is echoed uh, you know across the trustworthy and responsible AI landscape that. Um, it can't just be, yes, it is absolutely uh, organizational management has to be commit, committed to um, to managing risks. And um, without their commitment, it, without it, like everybody can be working, uh, the entire rest of the uh, organization can be working and it's not going to take hold. So at a minimum, the organizational management has to, has to be committed and it's their job. But once once they say that, it's kind of everybody's job. Fully realizing that, you know, one of those sayings, you know, once it's everybody's job, it's nobody's job. <laughs> but, you know, everybody has a role to play and thinking about thinking about risk. I like that, Reven. It, it comes maybe to a point you made at the very beginning of our conversation is that risk management is a people centric and, mm -hmm. um, you know, defining these roles and responsibilities is all part of this process of, you know, governing AI models. Um, Reva, I, I wanted to let you know that uh, one of our one of our uh, participants asked ChatGPT to tell them why their company should care about oh. the NIST paper, and it gave a very compelling answer. So you should oh, know that uh, 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 even ChatGPT is on your side. That's good. <laughs> we did hear the other day somebody sent us uh, that I was asked uh, asked ChatGPT what is the AI risk management framework, and it gave a really good answer. We we're like, oh, that's good, <laughs> relatively <laughs> accurate. <laughs> <laughs> for now. <laughs> That's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> well, Reva, thank you. This this has been wonderful. It's been, uh, I think, really helpful to me and our listeners to make uh, something that's really important, but can be seem esoteric to make it concrete and applicable. Um, so many of our listeners have been anticipating this 1.0 release. And, you know, when 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 one thinks of NIST, one thinks of standards and the way things are done. And so understanding the voluntary nature of this um, kind of really shifts the focus and the onus to be on us. Like it's up to us to, yeah. to adopt this and, and make it make these principles 
as, as, as guides and, and a resource. So Reva, we're, we're very appreciative of your time and the clarity that you brought to, this, brought to this topic today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And with that, we will wrap up our webinar. Please do reach out to us uh, at Robust Intelligence if you'd like to continue the conversation. Um, you will find shortly my email address and Ali's in the, in the chat, and please don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, uh, uh, like Hiram just said, uh, just to echo, uh, we please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, we're always uh, excited to chat to new people. Um, and thank you so much, Riva, for taking your time today. I know it's, it must be a crazy time for you talking to a million people about the AI RMF, but I guess it just shows that uh, people were really excited about it. <laughs> People are really excited about it, but I have also brand new questions. So thank you. Great. <laughs> I've got one of these questions. They're great. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined today.